Yes, uh, I'm Chuck Johnson. I'm the Director of Nuclear Programs for International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. I've been on the job for three months now, uh, but prior to that, I, off and on, I've uh, been staff to uh, our affiliate, American affiliate, uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility, both in our national office and also uh, in the North Pacific Northwest region. Um, Physicians for Social Responsibility actually is the parent organization of IPPNW, interestingly enough, even though it's affiliate. It was founded in the early 1960s by some, a group of doctors here in the Boston area, uh, centered around the Harvard Medical School, and they issued a series of reports, including the seminal medical consequences of thermonuclear war in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, in uh, May of 1962. Uh, and was part of the movement in the United States to uh, at least get the limited test ban treaty and urge for disarmament at that time. Uh, after its uh, revival in the 1970s, uh, PSR became active again in the 1970s, and a couple of the co-founders of, of uh, PSR, Dr. Bernard Laun and others, and then also with colleagues in uh, the, the Soviet Union, Yevgeny Chezov, who was a, uh, uh, a, a fellow uh, cardiac medicine um, medical doctor uh, from, from uh, the Soviet Union, founded IPPNW uh, with the goal of educating uh, people around the world about the dangers of thermonuclear war. Um, this uh, uh, included uh, cooperating with Dr. Carl Sagan and others uh, in um, promoting the uh, the new research that was done on uh, nuclear winter, uh, the discussion of how if enough nuclear weapons were exploded uh, that the atmosphere would be darkened enough that it would in fact freeze crops and kill potentially billions of people. Uh, in 1985, IPPNW received the Nobel Peace Prize and our organization has continued to advocate nuclear abolition ever since with uh, 63 affiliates, uh, affiliates in 63 countries. Um, Ten years ago, uh, when there seemed to be, it seemed that progress among nuclear weapons states in arms control treaties um, what had stalled and uh, new states were moving toward developing nuclear weapons capabilities, uh, the nuclear abolition movement uh, appeared to be stagnating at that point. IPPNW affiliates in Australia and, and Malaysia uh, proposed that a new treaty be introduced through the United Nations banning the possession, use, or threat to use nuclear weapons based upon their humanitarian effects. Following the lead shown by treaties banning chemical and biological weapons and landmines and cluster munitions. Uh, IPPNW sought out partner groups, eventually the 10 current members of the International Steering Group, uh, and, con and constituted a new group, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, or ICANN. And I put a couple of the websites over there in case you want to do it. They're easily Google, obviously. Um, arguments for uh, Treating nuclear weapons like other banned methods of warfare are obvious, but have been explained in detail in the, tr in the treaty, including one, uh, the immense destruction from nuclear weapons use that would indiscriminately kill non-combatants through blast, fire, and radiation. Uh, two, uh, the vulnerability of women at twice the rate of men and children, uh, and children at four times the rate of adults to suffer medical consequences from radiation exposure, including cancers, immune deficiencies, and genetic damage. And three, the potential even in a limited nuclear war, such as between India and Pakistan, as established by researchers led by Dr. Alan Roback and others in 2012, could create a dust cloud that would cool the planet enough to cause crop failures throughout the globe and put up to two billion people with a B, the majority of them non-combatants, at risk of st uh, starvation. Uh, momentum has built for the United Nations Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons as member states began to indicate support for it, and additional non-governmental organizations joined the effort to get it introduced at the UN. ICANN now has over 400 partner organizations. Since our founding, we have worked to build a powerful global groundswell of public support for the abolition of nuclear weapons. 
by engaging a diverse range of groups and working alongside the Red Cross and like-minded governments who have helped reshape the debate on nuclear weapons and generate momentum towards elimination. Years of laborious work through the UN processes with the active opposition of the nuclear weapons states who encouraged their allies to boycott the discussions still resulted in passage of the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons at the United Nations in New York on July 7th, 2017 by a vote of 122 to one to one. So obviously there were a lot of countries not present, but uh, a large ma a majority definitely were present and voted yes. Uh, ICANN was awarded the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize for our work to draw attention to the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of any use of nuclear weapons and our groundbreaking efforts to achieve a treaty-based prohibition of such weapons. Throughout the negotiating process, ICANN worked alongside governments to achieve the strongest, most effective treaty possible. About two-thirds of the world's nations voted in favor of adopting the agreement. Our focus now is on persuading nations to sign and ratify it and then to work for its full implementation. When 50 countries have officially signed and ratified the treaty, it will go into force worldwide. So far, 58 have signed and seven have ratified. And uh, we hope to increase those numbers significantly in the next year and a half. We're hoping to reach the, the goal of 50 ratifications by two years of after the uh, treaty has passed. Um, Nuclear weapon states take the ban treaty much more seriously than they want to admit. Otherwise, why would they oppose it if it has no meaning? They realize that it undermines the very legal and moral basis of their perceived right to possess and threaten to use nuclear weapons. An argument that has been used in the nuclear weapons ban that is that the nuclear weapons ban treaty undermines the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. But what has actually been undermining it is the refusal of the nuclear weapon states to make progress on Article 6 of the NPT, the language which requires the acknowledged nuclear weapon states to make progress toward the goal of total elimination of nuclear weapons. This progress is lacking, and in fact, the reason that new states are seeking nuclear weapons has historically been to defend themselves against invasion and attack by nuclear weapon states. Rather than progress toward disarmament, uh, progress towards disarmament. Since 2000, all nine nuclear weapon states have been improving their arsenals and their capacity to use nuclear weapons in warfare, relying on the Cold War concept of mutually assured destruction to deter nuclear attack. U.S. development of anti-ballistic missiles has led to Russian development of newer, more difficult to track nuclear weapons delivery systems which were on display recently at a presentation to the Russian public by President Putin. Alarming threats bouncing back and forth between North Korea and the United States, threatening fire and fury like the world has never seen, and limited bloody nose attacks have made the world realize that relying on nuclear weapons to deter attack depends upon rational leaders and on systems working without failure or without fatal miscommunication as nuclear weapon states fear losing their ability to use their nuclear weapons if they don't act within minutes of learning of a potential attack. Uh, you heard earlier several people talk about the close calls we've had. And uh, again, as tensions mount, the, the chances of miscalculation increase. We cannot continue to rely upon mutually assured destruction or MAD to protect us from the horror that would result from a nuclear war, and current events show us that we must work together to abolish these weapons altogether, or one day they will be used. Um, I guess in closing, I would say uh, in the United States, we're in the, the tough, uh, you know, as, as activists in the US, we're in the tough position of trying to promote a treaty that we probably, our nation may be one of the last ones to sign. Uh, so to some degree, um, to the extent that we can encourage other nations to lead the way on this particular uh, treaty, um, they will be doing that. Um, and then to the extent that we can get our government not to put the type of pressure that it's been putting on countries uh, to keep them from signing these, these treaties. And 
as time goes on, um, some of our, as some of our allies and some of the allies of other nuclear weapon states consider signing this treaty and sign on, such as uh, at this point, um, Sweden, which is not a NATO country but does have a military alliance with the United States, has voted for this treaty and is considering signing it. Norway, depending upon if their government changes in the next couple of years, may uh, uh, also is a NATO country and may also sign this treaty. Um, and the pressure will continue to mount um, as it has with other treaties of this type, with the landmine treaty and, and others of that type. Obviously, nuclear weapons are sort of, they're interwoven into the United States' uh, military strategic policy. And so it's going to take time and undoubtedly additional treaty and verification uh, models and agreements with the other nuclear weapon states before the United States would be comfortable signing a treaty like this. But um, at the local level, uh, I know Mass Peace Action is working on uh, an effort to, with don't, um, don't bank on the bomb, uh, to promote um, uh, nuclear abolition efforts and people taking their money out of, out of nuclear and to stigmatize nuclear weapons and, and treat them as the horrendous weapon that they are and not as something that protects us. And I see my time's up. Thank you very much. I will invite the whole panel to respond to any questions. And if you have a question, raise your hands high so I can see where you're at. And call. Here we are right here. Um, you? Yes. John first, and then, oh, go yeah, ahead, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. Can, I, mean, go ahead. I was just going to say, um, no, that, that has, it hasn't been brought up in Congress. Um, there are a number of important measures that have been brought up. Maybe John could talk about those a little bit, but in terms of in dealing with the Korea situation and the, the idea of uh, the president having the right to launch nuclear weapons without Congress's approval. So maybe you want to talk about those things. And he's right, the no is the answer to your first question on that. And it doesn't look as if anybody in Congress at the current moment wants to take the leadership on something that bold. Uh, they're a little bit frozen from this notion that, you know, the military can do no wrong and if the military comes in and testifies that we have to have this as part of our strategic plan, I think that people aren't even knowledgeable enough to know how to challenge that and how to push back. So we've got a lot of educational work to do to get people in that leadership position to do that. Uh, or, and what we do have is somebody like Ed Markey uh, and Ted Lieu in the House, Ed Markey in the Senate, who have filed a bill for uh, not allowing the president on the president's own initiative to be the one that starts a nuclear war. Uh, I think the Constitution is pretty clear on that, but uh, White Houses continually deny that, think that they have the authority, and this bill would make it clear that, you know, no, no one individual, no president is going to be able to start and initiate a, a nuclear war. But even in that bill, uh, Ed felt constrained and had to put in there, uh, but he reserved the right to, to respond uh, or defend if somebody else were coming at you on that. Adam Smith has a bill that's a little bit uh, more direct on that, just says no first use uh, of a nuclear bomb or whatever, which would make sense to most of us in this room. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, again, you can see the history of the number of times that the United States has used the threat of nuclear power to uh, try and get its way on that, so it mitigates against that. There's also a, a bill that's filed, I think, again by Adam Smith um, and Kana, maybe uh, from California, uh, that there'll be no uh, action, military action taken in North Korea unilaterally or initiated uh, by the United States without a vote of Congress. Just a, a I don't think Adam's a good person to work with. He's come a long way on this issue, and he's, he's leading on it. I'm not sure that uh, as a ranking member of the Armed Services Committee and possibly the chair next time, whether he'd want to do that. Uh, he's trying to hold his committee together. But we have a number of people, I think, that are being uh, more inclined to be champions these days. Just in the Senate, I named Ed Markey, but you've also got Merkley. Uh, you've got Dianne Feinstein. Uh, Elizabeth Warren is stepping up to the plate quite actively in a lot of these things. 
uh, White House. So you've got people that, uh, Heinrich, you know, Murphy, the people that are really uh, becoming more knowledgeable, a little more aggressive on that. And then the House, you know, several members as well, in addition to Adam Smith, uh, Mike Quigley, uh, you go down the list on that. I'm not sure that any of them are at the point where they would do that, uh, but they certainly could be edged in that direction. Joseph. I just wanted to come in and, and say that I think we, the situation is so urgent right now uh, that rather than deal with something that is most unlikely, uh, we need to be doing all that we can to prevent a war with North Korea. And we need to be doing all that we can to hold on to, to the Iran agreement. I mean, the stakes are enormous. And, and, and I think we need to, to focus on trying to, you know, to save humanity or at least prevent genocide. The other piece I would say is that in terms of how we, how we do the movement building so it becomes possible to, 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 to move members of Congress, you know, I think as, as Jonathan King has done for a very long time here, we, as we heard in the first panel, we need to be talking about how the preparations for nuclear war are impacting people's lives on a, on a daily basis, right? I mean, what we're, what we're losing because of it. Uh, and I think this is how we, we, we build the foundations for movement. I mean, the, the reality is the only way we're going to change policy is with popular movement. I mean, we did that with the freeze movement. We did it with the civil rights movement. Uh, we did it with, with Vietnam. But this is what it takes. It takes education. It takes organizing, organizing, organizing in ways that impact, that people can understand how it relates to their lives. Uh, you know, there's no guarantee that a, a war with, with Korea, if a disastrous one for the Korean Peninsula, would remain on the Korean Peninsula. I mean, the Chinese have, 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 have their, uh, their ambitions, have their, their sense of how the world should, order, should be ordered. Uh, we have an alliance with Japan. I mean, the stakes are high. Can I'll I just take, add one more thing on that? Yes. I think that a, a reasonable process on that, if we could get somebody in Congress to actually start having hearings, uh, sort of oversight hearings, and talking about what the consequences are. What does a modern-day nuclear uh, bomb stand to do in terms of consequences and damages? I don't think the public gets that, but it certainly would rivet their attention on that. And what are the consequences build off? And they have hearings on that, uh, about nuclear winter, the prospects of that. So just, first of all, the enormity of each bomb that would go off and how much more significant it would be than what was dropped in Japan, and then what the ripple effects are going out from that. If we could get somebody to have hearings on that, that would do it. And if we can't get a member of Congress to do that, then we've got to find a way, I think, in the peace and security community to have some sort of public hearings that get that information out there and are covered by media uh, and uh, digital uh, social media and things of that nature, because people don't get it. I'm convinced they just don't think that it's going to affect their lives or is that severe. They don't understand the nuclear winter prospect and they don't understand the, the catastrophic size of even a single nuclear weapon. They still think it's Japan. Uh, uh, Charles wants to comment, and then I'm going to take two questions, and then we're going to move on because we've got a whole day, and you can <laughs> pop them. I'm going to go young on the questions. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I just wanted to follow up because uh, Joe uh, started to raise uh, the issue about how do how do we respond to the crisis in Korea, and I happened to jot down some ideas on that, and I just want to share them with you. Um, I have become convinced that the very important thing for uh, folks who want to be active about this issue here in the United States is to follow the lead of people in South Korea. There is a substantial uh, peace community, peace movements of various sorts, organizations in South Korea. Uh, South Korea, in terms of people in the region that we can relate to, is deeply involved in this process of trying to make peace on the, on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, if we are to stop the United States from preventive war there, it's, it's going to be through their leadership. So there's all sorts of solidarity things uh, that can happen. Uh, you can sponsor people from South Korea coming here to speak and so forth. Uh, I think over here we can also begin to raise the issue of a Korean Peninsula uh, nuclear weapons-free zone. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, it's been talked about before, but it needs to become high in the consciousness of people here that that's a feasible, possible way to go. Um, and you know, and then we need to be prepared as we can to counter uh, the 
the misdirection, the misinformation is going to come out of Washington about these issues. Well, let, me just, let, me just, let me just add that the, 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 the summit between uh, President Moon and, and Kim is the 27th of this month. And we are organizing nationally, it's the 26th here, we're organizing a national call-in to members of Congress on either the 25th or the 26th. And I expect that Peace Action will be sending out notice uh, of, of, of that call-in date because this is how we can kind of mobilize and put pressure from members of Congress in support of, of, of President Moon's diplomacy. I know I'm infringing on our lunch hour, but there are, there are a couple of voices I want to get in here. And so if it's okay for me to proceed, just a couple more. Let me just hear you say, go ahead. Okay. I, I said I'll go young. I, I got the other hand, so I've been going. I see Kate, and did I see another youthful hand? All, I know I, some of you older youth, too. We'll get you. <laughs> Kate first, and then we'll come right back over here in the jacket right here, and then right here in the striped sweater. domestic diaspora organizing groups who you've been able to work with on these issues um, who might be good resources for other organizers to bring to the So uh, I mentioned at the beginning the conference we're organizing in New York. Uh, so we're going to have uh, representatives there from the International Peace Bureau, uh, the kind of leading, leading figures uh, from the European uh, nuclear disarmament and, and peace movement. Uh, we'll have uh, Hiroshi Taka, who until recently was the uh, General Secretary of the Japan Council Against Atomic and Hydrogen Bombs, which again is one of the, uh, is the leading organization in Japan and works closely with, with A-bomb survivors. Um, there are a host of other organizations, and I'll be glad to, 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 to correspond with people if you want to talk about a particular country. Uh, in terms of, of diaspora communities, I would, I would point, among others, to the Women Cross the DMZ uh, initiative led by uh, Christine Ahn, uh, who's out in, she's now in Hawaii, but the work she's done is, is absolutely tremendous. And, and she works with a strong network of, of Korean Americans. Uh, and then we can kind of, you know, you need to talk about in each, each nationality to see where, you know, which, what, that, what that diaspora community is. But there's a number of them that are uh, deeply involved. In, ter ahead, in terms of uh, <clears throat> international organizations, not so much the diaspora community, but uh, uh, groups throughout the world, if you go to the ICANN website, there are over 400 groups that have joined ICANN and all um, uh, in, in pledging to fight for the abolition of nuclear weapons, and, and that should give you a, a number of different ideas of groups if you're interested in that. And on campuses, you might consider linking up with Asian clubs, and, and that's another way to get access to connection. So, um, actually, John, Kiri um, answered my question about strategic role in the POI peace mechanism, too, that you mentioned in the previous question. Great. Thank you. Yes. I want to bring up the concept. You had an opportunity to have the United States take that position during the Obama administration, and at the very end of it, it looked like he was inclined and started the debate, and his cabinet talked him out of it. So you're going to have a hard time getting a treaty with nine doing it, the so-called leader won't take that step. And it goes back to things that even the panel here has been saying. That they're not inclined to want to give up the, the use of, of that as a threat. All right, they won't admit it, and they won't say that they've done it, and it happens secretively more often than not. Uh, and what did you say, the 20 or 30 times, Joe, mm -hmm. that they use it as a threat? And it's happening now, right? So they're, they're not inclined to give it up. It would be a nice idea, and it would be something that people in this room would support, but 
it's, it's funny how the people in the military are all are cleverer than we are and are smarter than we are all mm. of this, and you're sort of weak-kneed and ignorant if you think that we shouldn't be you know, keeping you know, those types of weapons and using them as a threat. And that's a big thing to overcome. So when somebody gets up in front of Congress and tells you how necessary it is for our national defense strategy, uh, there aren't too many who are knowledgeable enough to push back, and that's something we have to work on. I'd like to weigh in on this as well, because I think in some of the things that we do in the peace movement, we got a lot of slogans, little catchy phrases, but there's no action behind them. And I think we need to remember that, look, those who are elected, if they won't act, you know who has to act? The people who do the electing. And who is that but us? We, cannot, we can't pass it on. And i tell you another reality. Some of those who need to go into the halls of Congress are the young people who are on our campuses now who are doing peace work, who would become a better legislator and serve the people much better than those who have sold out on their statesmanship. So we need to always remember that, that when they won't act, we still have to act. We don't have to beg, we need to demand. And when they don't meet the demand, we still have to act. That's it. And that's not a joke, you keep moving. That's not a joke, young folks, because you know how some folks look at you. But folks also go by imagery. Do you know what politicians do? They take a picture and then they add whatever caption they want like they really did something. Uh, it's a two-way game, but we're doing it for the good reason. <laughs> Wow, this, the rock's on. 
Yeah, and eventually you get um, 